The world that you and I know, the history of our civilization, the basic understanding that we have of one another is forged in one universal truth, story. Story is about capturing a moment in time, an essence, and inviting an audience to a shared experience. It's story, not facts, that have led teams, secured partnerships in business and marriage, started wars, perpetuated isms, prevented trees of compassion and collaboration amongst cultures of difference. Belief in story can be powerful and dangerous at the same time, but belief in story can uplift cultures around the world. It's that stream of story that has taken me across the planet. Stories introduced me to people in places foreign to me in substance, success, stature, and constitution. To the most iconic of people, and holiest, the Pope, to personalities like Charles Barkley, Deepak Chopra, and Sammy Hagar, to the most unique and nameless from third world countries. And I've learned something in my travels. I've learned that our differences easily define our positions, but it's our desire for interconnectivity and community that author our stories. Futurist Toshi Hu espouses that story is actually our evolutionary survival technology. I happen to agree. Stories are critical for our humanity's survival, not just at a surface level, but our ability to understand deep within ourselves the narratives that either escalate or de-escalate affronts to our cultural practices. My dear friend Sundar Rahman, the director of the Museum of the Future in Dubai in the UAE, says that stories are only as rich as our imagination, and our imagination is only as rich as our literacy. Literacy is an extension of the oral story and the propagator of the development of our species. It's easy to say that stories can memorialize a love poem or a religious scripture or presentations at work or school, but no. Stories can serve as a survival mechanism. Story took me to the doorstep of a 23-year-old named Congo Rabina. Congo Rabina's story is rich with narrative to include the agony of defeat. You see, she lost her parents years ago to unknown circumstances and was raised until lately by her late uncle. And the focus was education, to give her a path forward. See, she works for an organization that has positioned her as an advocate for her people, to rise through story, through literacy. Congo Rabina is a refugee. She is South Sudanese. She's a woman and a member of a community that is committed to rise up against oppression, I see her story as different. You might think of her, and I would not blame you as an audience, to think of a refugee living in extreme conditions. But I see a different narrative for her. I see a woman entrenched in stoicism who is maneuvering the waves of doubt and self-belief to understand the insecurities of food, water, and spirit. Congo Rabina's doorstep is at the border of the equator. And if travel is the great indulgence of opportunity, then I contend that story is the currency to broker new opportunities of connections between a Mzungu like me, meaning white man, and a 23-year-old South Sudanese adult orphan whose smile is as wide as the African sun that blankets her existence. You see, I just returned from the Mvepi refugee settlement in northwest Uganda, bordering the Congo and South Sudan. She is but one of 70,000 displaced human beings calling Mvepi home. That's 5,000 more that can fill Raymond James Stadium just down the street for an NFL football game at capacity. Of the residents, 58% are children, with a staggering student-to-teacher ratio of 600 to 1. 600 to 1. And I had a front row seat to a project that unveiled stories, folklore, from several hundred years in Eastern Africa. Now, of the 50 stories or so that I heard during my time, a central character emerged in almost every story. Now, I should tell you for context that East Africa was colonized in the mid-1800s by the Belgians, the British, and the Germans. And it's at this time that the hare emerged. Now, we know the tortoise and the hare, and our neighbors to the east across the pond have maybe a few stories of Peter the Rabbit. 
But we're not talking one or two stories. The hare in Eastern Africa was a part of hundreds, if not thousands of stories, where in one he would battle a fox and the next an elephant. And as the locals would tell these stories, even if through an interpreter, the end often concluded as it began, with the hare identifying a great injustice. Identifying this injustice, drawing attention to the ruckus, and then narrowly escaping capture each and every time. Now, the Westerners would say that the hare was tricky, dishonest, deceitful, deceptive, or at minimum, a silly character in part of a children's story. But I learned from the locals that the hare represented something, a pushback against oppression, against the stealing of one's sense of constitution, of community and connection. In fact, the hare represented a symbol to navigate oppression. Now, if you believe that story, The hare isn't violating any values that he has or cheating himself, no. He's being tricky to survive against a litany of predators to include lions, hyenas, and most importantly, colonists. But story can often challenge us. Story, if you're the hare, you may not have options or opportunities, but you're going to find them. And regardless of origin, story happens to always find the sunlight, because story cannot hide. You see, story looks for the inspiration of engagement and enlightenment and connection. What I'd like for you to do with me right now is to rewind. Let's travel back before Uganda, a couple of months. And we're all in the city center of Stockholm, Sweden, just before, moments before interviewing who I deem to be the next Steve Jobs. Giovanni Feely, the CEO and founder of Exeger, a man in constant motion who has charged himself with solving the planetary problem of power, of electricity, one flexible solar cell at a time. Now, his inspiration started early on in his youth in the forest of Sweden, a bit of a rite of passage, I learned, where youth go in the summer and plant thousands of trees over several years. Now, growing up, he had a minefield of no's told to him but he persisted, wanting to author his own story to create impact and innovation in manufacturing, not knowing that he comes from a lineage of incredible and notable manufacturing giants at the time. And here's what's amazing. His story is on the precipice of becoming our story, democratizing power so that the Congo Rabinas of the world can dream bigger today and tomorrow than they ever thought possible. Now, I call him the Mozart of manufacturing, and no one person can pinpoint why a young Swede in the middle of the forest 35 years ago would dream of solving a planetary problem. But what I can tell you is, his perseverance to me is steeped in something he shared with me in an offhanded comment when we were spending time together. I live my life like a shark, in constant motion. Or like a shark, I die. Stories are a lot like sharks. They need to be in constant motion, shared and disseminated. We can learn from one another, generation to generation. His story pulled me in, if I'm honest with you, made me think about my story, my narrative, and why sometimes stories lean in my favor and sometimes they do not. I would ask all of you, how has your story changed to influence the outcome of a job interview, the perception of a first date, or presentation at work or at home? Why did I just take you to the seared landscape of Uganda, to the bustling city center of Stockholm, into the vast forest of Sweden, home to 10 million people? Because story can serve as a reminder, as refuge, as a point of inspiration for our opportunities and blessings to come in the future. But story doesn't have to be poetic or adrenaline pumping to connect us. Story, though, can bolt together generations. You might be asking, what is the utility of story? Well, it buys us time, extends favor, and gives us an opportunity as a group to understand our collective why. Story can get us out of a jam or into a jam, depending upon our perspective. Story can sway popular opinion, uncover great injustices, or identify an incredible feat of human ingenuity. Story is embedded in everything that we do. The scientific method, diplomacy, negotiation. Brene Brown quipped in her TED talk that story might just be data wrapped with a soul. 
And if she's right, that data is coming at us incredibly fast and in packaging we can't recognize, creating the haves and the have-nots. The chasm is growing, and I think we're staring down the barrel of the rich and poor, those who find the world accessible versus inaccessible, those experiencing Western gluttony of overages to the insecurity of food and water. Story, in the context of story, threads together the messiness of our lives. New York Times best-selling author and notable TED Talk speaker Daniel Pink, besides being very gracious and kind to a storyteller over a decade ago, recently commented on the state of our lives, saying that in short, we are stimulus rich and context poor. A powerful statement by Pink. Whether you are a Giovanni Fili or a Congo Rabina, we're standing here today at a TEDx talk. Authentically. Stories allow us the opportunity to connect with those that we thought previously were too far afield, and we know this is true. But if we actually stop and put our social media down and stop looking at story conflate with fact, we might have a different experience. But if we're honest with ourselves, we've all opened up our Facebook. We've seen stories posted glittered. Of a family vacation photo, only to discover that underneath that glitter is sadness. Why should we care when we can shade the truth, alter facts, make the mundane extraordinary? We are social and creative beings, and this incredible futuristic technology that we are a part of is incredible until it isn't. Until our social media media handles stop buzzing, our phones stop dinging, and our IMs start stop hopping. You see, we're part of something. All of us. We're part of the creator economy. The creator economy is a hundred billion dollar industry and growing very fast. And if it has its way, it's going to be authoring our stories, both personally and professionally. Do you know that our children, mine and yours, in short order, will be working in workplaces where their colleagues will not all be human? Technology is advancing so fast that almost anybody can create technology, but not everybody can create story. And it's that lack of creativity that puts our species at peril and risk in the future. Train technological progress has long left the station, and I would contend that we either adapt like the hare, or we run the risk of becoming refugees of the very world that we have constructed. The period of innovation that we are in currently is the fourth industrial revolution, characterized as the blurring of lines between technology and human. The fifth industrial revolution is fast upon us. It espouses a harmonious relationship between man and machine. The question is this: Whether we choose the path or the path is chosen for us, will we find safe passage from the fourth to the fifth industrial revolution, or an occupation of thought, not of our own? I think story is humanity's hook to connection, to prosperity, friendship, joy, and love. Automated representations and images of ourselves put us all at risk of misrepresentation. The commonality that we all seek, that connection, can only happen with a proper sequence of letters that form words, that lean into sentences, that form paragraphs, prose, sonnets, and stories. The fifth industrial revolution is fast upon us. Let us not forget that it's the stories that have built up over time to build the algorithms of our current experience. Now I have to be honest with you. I have a river of curiosity that runs through my veins, and I would suspect a number of you do as well. And that river of curiosity is taking me around the planet and back again. And I've come to a bit of a conclusion. It's that story is our currency. And if story is our currency, that our individual voice and contribution serve as collateral for our time here on Earth. Stories cannot be contrived or distilled from algorithms and digital collecting bots, and then serve as our collective biographers. No. Stories, even if driving the creator economy with or without blueprints or rules, provides a window into the value that we place. At the intersection of commerce and story, we may feel like we're being lapped by technology, but I would say that we're, we are merely chasing our own tails. We are frail human beings. The story of a lifetime 
and the narrative of a generation. Data me Data may be the new oil characterized by ones and zeros, but I contend that the pixelated present is dotted with fantastical stories yet to be told. And as we w let the fourth industrial revolution wash over us, it's data and the soul of our stories that is at battle. If currency is our story, do we have enough in our narrative to author generations moving forward? I contend yes. The question is this. When I sit down to interview you, what will you share that will connect us? Because I'll be curious. Are you embracing your own story at work and at home? And if not, why? Thank you.